Oh, my God. Yeah. So let me have that back, and I'll just grab my computer. Can I take it? No. Yes. It's the it's one that says Green Bank. Alright, so the session printed in your program is off by 10 minutes. Session 8 actually begins at 11.15. We're running a little bit late, but we'll make do. These are all guidelines anyways. Um, continuing with the intersectionality of this meeting, this session is Perspectives from the Social Sciences and Humanities. Each of the talks in this session will be 15 minutes plus 5 minutes of questions. And Kicking off session eight is Ted Peters with the Graduate Theological Union in Astrotheology and Astrobiology. So, welcome, Ted. Uh, can you hear me if I talk loudly without the mic? I trust. Uh, my middle name is Frank, so I had my wife take my picture in front of the GBT standing like this. <laughs> I. Uh, Come from, yeah, get around David. Here. Uh, <clears throat> Berkeley, California, where we have the Center for Theology and Natural Sciences at the uh, Graduate Theological Union. We've been working for about 10 years on a product that just came out last year, a book called Astrotheology. And uh, it, includes, it includes authors who are astronomers, astrobiologists, theologians, and um, ethicists. Our center has been in existence for about 30 years. Charlie Towns' name has been mentioned frequently. He was on our board until uh, he passed away a couple of years ago. We do offer uh, courses, and this is our faculty. This is Carl Pennypacker from Cal Berkeley, a cosmologist who specializes in dark energy and uh, dark matter. And this is Asteron, a guest professor for the day. <laughs> Uh, astrotheology will be drawing out the theological and to some extent religious implications of astrobiology and the search for extraterrestrial life. So, um, astrobiology, astrotheology is not uh, an attempt to use science or reason to prove the existence of God or any other doctrine of that sort. That's not its task. Uh, rather, uh, it's a search for consonants under the assumption there will be consonants uh, between uh, knowledge of the world gained through science and uh, the way it is that a religious person understands God's creation. We hope that the dialogue, the interaction between faith and science will actually lead to fertile research, progressive uh, research program, and uh, so one of the things we do is we'll put scientists in a room with theologians, philosophers, and ethicists, like dice, shake them up, see what happens. <laughs> Specifically for astrotheology, we've got four tasks, and I'll mention these uh, briefly here. Um, the first is uh, the doctrine of creation and the pesky problem of geocentrism, which seems to be so much in public discussion, the question of incarnation, which is going to be specifically a Christian question, um, a critique of the space sciences. It's not unusual for science to cloak itself in religion and be religious as if somehow or other they can practice theology without a license. And uh, then uh, getting ready for uh, contact and uh, what we do between now and then, which we're going to call astroethics. Uh, first, the question of geocentrism that seems to be a widespread legend that religiously narrow-minded people couldn't tolerate Copernicus. They never thought about the possibility there are other realities. Uh, that's not the case. Stephen Dick is one of the two really great historians who has shown the question of one world versus many worlds has been around for 2,500 years and in medieval Europe. Uh, here we have St. Thomas Aquinas, probably uh, the world's greatest uh, Christian theologian. 
And yes, he was a geocentrist. He said it's necessary that all things belong to one world. There is only one world. Why did he think that? Because the Bible told himself no. Because Aristotle thought that. Perfection and oneness go together. So it was a philosophical uh, position that led to his geocentrism. Um, he was um, subsequently uh, followed by another professor at the University of Paris, John Buridan, who discussed the same matter and came up with the opposite conclusion. Who cares what Aristotle said? On the basis of scripture, yeah, God could make as many worlds as God wants. Point. These people were talking about this. Open debate. There wasn't any like fragility or rigid uh, dogma surrounding uh, that particular uh, issue. Um, <clears throat> here's Muzaffar Iqbal, a good friend. He's the editor of the journal Islam and Science. Uh, he's a biochemist, specializes in evolution. What do you think? Well, he cites the Quran, as almost every Islamic theologian will do, and then interprets it. Yes, uh, there could be intelligent life on extraterrestrial planets. Uh, Norbert uh, Samuelson, um, Hebrew scholar, specializes in religion and science. And I, I said, Norbert, I want you to kind of represent what you think the Jewish position would be on these issues. And he says, God is really alien. <laughs> so God becomes the paradigm for understanding the otherness uh, of the aliens. Are they there? Well, they could very well be. Um, here's uh, Stephen Dick wrote a chapter for our book. Uh, he likes the term cosmo uh, theology, and uh, here uh, he makes this proposal. We should replace the ancient biblical idea of a personal God with, now his words, the God, a God in the universe rather than outside it. He calls this religious naturalism. Yes, it fits uh, the genre of religious naturalism, even though... Uh, it's Stephen's own uh, take on it. Um, I'd like to deal directly with um, the concept of a religious crisis. You find this in the rags that you buy at the grocery store, uh, and uh, you also find it in some of the more uh, sophisticated literature. I'm going to pick on uh, Paul Davies here. He's easy to pick on. Uh, he's a physicist turned astrobiologist at Arizona State. So he writes, the existence of extraterrestrial intelligences would have a profound impact on religion, shattering completely the traditional perspective of God's relationship with man. So that's his prediction. I want to know whether that's true or not. So uh, let's, let's try to figure out whether that's true. Let's formulate a hypothesis. Official confirmation of the discovery of a civilization of intelligent beings living on another planet would so undercut traditional religious beliefs that Earth's religious traditions would face a crisis. So that's the hypothesis. Let's see what evidence might confirm or disconfirm that. So we conducted what's called the Peter's ETI Religious Crisis Survey. Uh, Julie Frelick was my uh, graduate student. And we asked people to self-identify with one or another religious position. Here we've got uh, Roman Catholics and liberal Protestants and conservative Protestants, Mormons, Buddhists, um, uh, etc. Uh, we didn't get enough um, uh, Hindus to count, but nevertheless, we did get a selection. Here's a question. Official confirmation of the discovery of a civilization of intelligent beings living on another planet would so undercut my beliefs that my beliefs would face a crisis. Look at the disagree or disagree seriously. In other words, the vast majority, regardless of religious tradition, uh, we have non-religious included there, they're not going to have a problem. 
We asked for comments. There was one Protestant who said, I'd share a pew with an alien any day. <laughs> All right, we asked uh, another question, uh, and it's very close to the first one. In this case, it's not my particular beliefs, but my tradition. And note just a slight change. Oh, yes, overwhelmingly, no problem, but if I'm a Catholic, I'm a little worried about the Vatican. Uh, they don't, probably don't know there's a Vatican Observatory, but uh, I am worried about the Pope, even though I'm not going to have a problem. But uh, even so, there's very little sense of fragility about my religious or non-religious tradition. Um, as I said, we get comments. Um, the Buddhists were like almost 100%. I mean, there wasn't even a crack in it. Uh, here's a Buddhist... Uh, response that speaks to the geocentrism issue to think that in the infinity of the universe that we are the only intelligent life form in existence is ludicrous. I would only hope those beings would exhibit more wisdom than humans have in how they relate to their world and fellow beings. Let's hope they're better uh, than uh, we are. I don't see any uh, uh, fragility here about this Buddhist facing a crisis. Now, the non-religious, self-identified non-religious, oh my goodness, um, non-religious uh, are an interesting group because on the one hand, uh, they look like the religious, but on the other hand, they don't. Let me just skip and say that what we saw there was the two kinds of non-religious. It would be the atheist and then someone who is spiritual but does not want to associate with a formal religious tradition. Uh, we didn't discriminate between those two. Okay, so on this same question, would my non-religious beliefs be affected? Again, no problem. But <laughs> we did have a question, what do you think is going to happen to those other people? So if we say... Even though my non-religious viewpoint um, would remain unaffected, what about the world's religions? Whoa, it's the world's religions that are going to have a problem. So I'm not religious, but those religious people are going to face a crisis, even though they don't think they're going to face a crisis. <laughs> so where does this misinterpretation come from? It's not from religious people. It's from non-religious people telling us what's going on. Therefore, I want to say, not confirmed. First, I'd like to thank everyone for leaving me. Okay, back to Paul Davies. Okay, Paul, I got evidence that you are wrong. Okay? No, he says, Ted, I will not accept your evidence. I said, well, why not? Because religious people don't understand themselves. <laughs> oh, have you got evidence for that? Well, he says the Christians are going to suffer the worst because what are they going to do about Jesus? Here you got this incarnation. What are you going to do? Have, and I think this phrase came from Steve Dick, a planet hopping Christ <laughs> that goes from one planet to another. And Paul says that's absurd. So in our book um, that I mentioned, we asked four or five theologians, debate this issue, bring resources to bear. Uh, is this right or wrong? And about uh, maybe five uh, chapters on this question, four of them took up the planet hopping Christ. They're quite happy with multiple um, incarnations. So this illustrates the kind of mischief uh, that we uh, get into. Um, <clears throat> Third, uh, uh, offering an outside critique of what goes on within science. There is, within astrobiology, and we didn't see it here actually the last couple days, but from time to time if you're looking for it, there is a myth uh, that uh, it's a non-scientific myth uh, that has uh, uh, crept into astrobiological thinking. It goes something like this. Evolution is progressive. It goes from simple to complex, from stupid to intelligent. If evolution took place on another planet for a longer period of time, those people would be 
more intelligent than we are. On Earth, the most intelligent people are the scientists. Therefore, the most intelligent people on other planets are going to be the scientists. Therefore, we are the high priests of Earth because we can communicate with heaven. And two more planks in the myth that when we make contact, the human race will be greatly enriched. The human race will receive longer life through advanced medicine, peace on Earth, end of war, etc. It's a myth. And it's a myth that has a way of inspiring, it's not scientific, it has a way of inspiring science, uh, and uh, watch for it. It's a myth that's shared uh, both in some scientific communities as well as in the UFO community. And again, I just want to say, practicing theology without license. I like demythologizing. Okay, I need to finish up. I've got less than a minute. Um, we do try to formulate without necessarily solving uh, what the array of ethical issues are going to be in terms of planetary, I'm sorry, uh, space research. Then thinking about post-contact um, responsibilities and different types of alien civilizations we might uh, relate to. Uh, then uh, finally, I just want to say uh, there are lots of people working in this area and we'll have a panel on it later. Last point. I want to re, uh, reinforce what uh, uh, part of what Catherine Denning said yesterday about the value of the scientific community linking arms with people in the humanities and the social sciences to anticipate um, what the social impact might be in the event that the GBT gets fixed and we get a message in the next uh, day or two. Um, uh, the Human Genome Project, when it was born, um, included ELSI, Ethical, Legal, and Social Impact. We at the Center for Theology and Natural Sciences uh, got a grant for that. Uh, and, uh, <clears throat> James Watson, who headed it, said, first time he knows that theologians got a grant to do a scientific project. At any rate, I just want to say that's a good model as we think uh, in the future about funding uh, to include that right along with the science. My last point, we had a little debate on the pages of our journal, Theology and Science. Was Stephen Hawking right uh, that we should hide from ETI? Hawking says, the discovery of intelligent life elsewhere, by the way, he holds the, G the ETI myth, intelligent life elsewhere would spark greater compassion and humanity among us. And Catherine says, well, then why wait? <laughs> That's all. Thanks. Two minutes for questions. Ted, thank you for a, a very interesting and provocative talk. I, I've heard of your work, but, but wasn't uh, too familiar with it. I was really glad to hear you. So the, my question is, have you subjected your assertion of the existence of an ETI myth to the same kind of critical scrutiny that you have subjected Paul Davies' assertion of a religious crisis. Um, I uh, went and delivered my talk on the ETI method setting one day. There were about 90, 90 people there. And um, a couple of people got upset with me because I suggested that there might be a myth working within the halls of science. Um, and then um, uh, one fellow with a big smile on his face said, but we've got to invest in myth. This is the way we get our funding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the good news in that, by the way, I love SETI science. SETI does absolutely wonderful science. And on that issue yesterday about the negative, um, we've got to think of that as humor because, I mean, we're constantly, SETI is constantly logging new knowledge that everybody benefits from. So let that, we didn't find anybody kind of thing, just be a joke because the new knowledge is, is growing constantly with SETI. Um, what I did say is that religiously or spiritually, space just resonates with uh, spiritual sens sensibility. I use the word sensibility from Kant. And we know that, so there's nothing wrong with 
feeling that inner compulsion to want to go to the sky and to go beyond the sky and to recognize it for what it is. It's not science, but it's what inspires the scientists, but it inspires all everybody else as well. One or two more questions. So uh, I, I well, first, thanks. It's fun. Um, I want to the, the the idea that uh, you know early theologians were, were grappling with uh, the existence of other worlds. That's absolutely true. But the counterpoint, of course, is that Galileo wasn't exonerated until the 1980s, if I remember right. So th there is there is some truth there as well, right? No. <laughs> what? The concept of science that we have today, the word science appears in 1830. Okay? Secular discipline with these methods, 1830. Uh, the Germans never did change. It's still Wissenschaft, whether you do natural science, social science, or humanities. Still the same. So the idea of cutting science away from culture, away from religion, that's only two centuries old. So now you have to go back and retrieve a history. Well, what's the history going to be? Well, let's put in our science history, Copernicus, Kepler, Galileo, and Newton, the Copernican revolution. Let's do that. Well, did they call themselves scientists? No, they were natural philosophers. Were they outside the church? No, they were all in the church. Copernicus and Galileo were Roman Catholic. Galileo was a good Catholic. Uh, Kepler was a Lutheran, uh, Newton was an Anglican, Newton wrote more theology than science. So why do we remember him as a scientist instead of as a, as a theologian? The thing is, is that the um, uh, breaking of the consciousness of the Western mind in Europe was a gradual thing that took time, and this idea of science as a discrete thing over against society um, it took a while to get there. So Galileo didn't see himself as a scientist standing against narrow-minded religion. He, he just was ticked off at the Pope. One Catholic ticked off um, at, at another Catholic. So even though it's true that we gradually uh, sifted through Western culture until science became something discreet and unique and uh, autonomous, that just wasn't the case in the era of the Copernican Revolution. Uh, the scientific, what we would call the scientific community, didn't accept heliocentrism until Newton finally demonstrated that's the way it's got to be. That took a hundred years. Uh, remember, one more thing, the founders of the Royal Society were who? Clergy. Why? Because the clergy and the scientists were all the same people. So it's only a very recent thing that somehow or other science and religion have to stand against each other, and that occurred after Darwin in the 19th century. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Up next is David Grinspoon with the Planetary Science Institute, speaking on Earth in Human Hands, Shaping Our Planet's Future. Again, 15 minutes for the talk and five minutes for questions. Thank you. Actually, that was the old title. This is the new title. Oh, but that's all right. Um, I just want to say thank you to the organizers of this conference and thank you for inviting me. It's been a really um, fascinating and, and fun gathering. And I also want to acknowledge the uh, indigenous people who were originally on this land where we are now. Um, and I also want to make a really quick plug again, as um, Steve, Dick, and others have for the uh, Bloomberg chair at the Library of Congress. Uh, if you're at all interested in working in an interdisciplinary way across the, uh, the membrane or whatever it is between the sciences and um, the humanities, this is a wonderful opportunity. It was a wonderful experience for me. And they really do want scientists to apply as well as humanists as a uh, as was mentioned before, most of the um, chairs so far have been humanists, but two of us have been scientists. Three. And, um, three now, correct, thank you. Um, glad you wanted to keep the score. And um, the, uh, when I showed up there as the, as far as I knew, the first uh, and only scientist to be a scholar at the Library of Congress at that point, I was wondering if I would sort of be off in my own corner of the sandbox 
Um, I, w I welcomed the time and the resources of the library, but I didn't know if I, what it would be like to try to interact with the other scholars there. But what I found was a wonderful openness and interest and a lot of commonality and interest actually with um, environmental historians and theologians and uh, his, uh, other kinds of historians and, and literary scholars that I learned so much from and that really enriched my work. Um, and uh, it was surprising in many ways, and that was one of the ways. And so I really do encourage you to think about applying this. This is the title of my project there, and among other things, it led to a book that looked like this, except the cover doesn't move, unfortunately. <laughs> but um, what I'm going to do in the next uh, 15 or minutes or so is rocket through a few ideas which are developed in, sufficient, in significantly more depth, I think, um, in the book. But uh, you've all heard about the Anthropocene. I won't go into a lot of detail here. But it's a fruitful concept, if only because it, it sparks some, uh, some interesting disagreements. And we can argue about whether that's a good name for it. And there's a lot of argument about when it began. But uh, if you look at these different uh, representations of human uh, presence and human influence on the planet, there's no denying that there's something new happening on the planet that humans are involved in. And so that's why this is an interesting and I think useful concept. And you notice there's a sort of uh, similarity in the, the functional form of a lot of these. And this time post-World War II when everything sort of rockets up is in the field of, the nascent field of Anthropocene studies is often called the Great Acceleration. Um, so there's a lot of interesting discussion and argument about when it started. I've advocated that it starts here. Uh, in geology, stratigraphers talk about a golden spike, a typical rock strata that represents the start of a new epoch. And um, I've written an essay, I won't go into detail here, but I can send you a copy if you're interested, proposing that this is the perfect golden spike for the Anthropocene, also a relevant anniversary to be pointing this out. Um, so what is the Anthropocene in planetary history? Um, what will it be? Will it just be an event? It's sometimes referred to as the Anthropocene event in the literature. Is it an epoch, uh, some significant stretch of time with a beginning or an end? Uh, or might it be something even more significant in planetary history, some kind of a transition of which there have been a few? Um, this is another way really of asking, is human style intelligence adaptive or self-limiting. I'm going to be throwing out a lot of con uh, words here that I don't have time to try to define, and that doesn't mean that I haven't thought about how to define them. It means I don't have much time. Um, <laughs> so um, I think it might be useful for SETI to think of, quote, intelligence as not merely the appearance of some kind of a civilization on a planet, but a planetary transition to what we could call a sapiozoic eon in which cognitive processes become deeply integrated into planetary functioning. In other words, what we see here might be actually a radically new kind of geological change in which self-aware cognitive geological processes become significant. The beginning of a time when cognitive processes become a key part of planetary functioning, and then we're led to a question, can this become a stable, long-term part of the way a planet functions? And if you think about this in the geological time scale, the Anthropocene has been proposed as an epoch. Epochs are, you know, in this time scale, just these little fluctuations having to do with the interaction of the, the biota and changes on the planet. And they're interesting to us. They might not be that interesting to an alien astrobiologist in the sense that these are very particular to the history of a planet, where one might argue that the eons, these major transitions in the planet, are potentially more universal. I think I could argue that each of these four eons we've had so far could possibly have counterparts on other planets. And each of these represents a transition in the relationship between life and the planet. Very briefly, the, the origin of life, the, uh, uh, where life uh, took over the planet chemically, where life became complex. And I'm suggesting that it's possible that on some planets, maybe even this one, this advent of cognitive processes as key players in planetary evolution could be a new planetary transition which could begin what we could uh, hopefully call the Sapiozoic Eon. Um, in order for the Anthropocene to actually be the beginning of an eon, it would require this technological influence 
to become a long-term and stable part of a planet, which certainly implies a different behavioral mode than is currently being exhibited by, quote, intelligent technological life on this planet. From a systems perspective, the early stages of this transition are, I argue, always going to be highly unstable because global influence will precede global awareness or global control, and thus it will be characterized by unstable positive feedbacks. I have a whole chapter where I develop that more, but now I'm saying it in a sentence. However, conscious awareness and control can also be sources of stabilizing negative feedback. Inadvertent change characterizes most of what we've done with the planet so far, not all, and that will often uh, be characterized by positive feedbacks, where you are doing things and you don't really understand the consequences. But there are also examples of what I call planetary changes of the fourth kind, but they're uh, intentional changes, which can be characterized by negative feedback. You see you're doing something to the ozone layer that causes you to uh, react in, in, in a way where you, you fix it. This is a, if you think of an individual, this is a basic part of cognitive functioning, but on a planet, it's sort of a new radical thing. And you can also, I think, use the example of the fact that we are starting to perceive that we're damaging our biosphere and our, our um, well-being with our energy sources, and we're starting to respond to that by changing our energy sources. Yeah, it's too slow. Yeah, it's frustratingly, um, it, it's maddening in some ways, but you can see that uh, as something that is currently happening. Uh, and then looking in the future, you can imagine we could see asteroids coming, we could see dangerous climate changes coming. Now we're talking about tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years, but it's the same kind of process where there's a negative feedback, a controlling, uh, a, a stabilizing function that awareness plays. So. Many people have discussed this idea of a 21st century bottleneck, where you know it's the race between education and catastrophe, where our, we're getting very clever and very good at doing these things. The question is, can we get a handle on ourselves, or is this leading to uh, some kind of catastrophe? And the, the idea of the bottleneck is that there are um, two possible outcomes. Of course, there's a wide range of possible outcomes, but there's a bifurcation in time scales that if we some of us think, and I do think this, although I don't really have time to go into it, but there's some, some books about this, that if we get through this next century or two centuries, but of that time scale, then we will be set up to, um, we'll have gotten a handle on our technological skills and our, our necessity of having some kind of global governance, which is not the same thing as world government, um, to the point where we can um, use our skills to enhance survival, not just of ourselves, but of the other species we share this planet with, or not. But, um, by the way, the, the idea of a bottleneck is interesting because if you think of Earth history or the history of inhabited planets, arguably there was an early bottleneck, and um, Charlie Lineweaver talks about this. I talked about a similar concept in, in this book where um, long-term habitability may depend on the establishment, the early establishment of a robust and resourceful global living system. Um, and it may be something that a lot of planets miss, but that if you achieve that stability, then that may set you up for long life. So there's, there's the idea out there of, a, of an early bottleneck where life becomes global or dies out. And in similar fashion, we can ask if there's a bottleneck with so-called intelligence, uh, can this like life become a robust and deeply integrated planetary property. And this idea of a bifurcation in lifetimes has some interesting implications for SETI. And I've, some of you heard me talk about this before, and I'm going to be very brief here. But you can imagine a situation where most civilizations maybe don't make it through the bottleneck, but a few do, and become something very different and very long-lived. And there are a lot of implications. One is that the Drake equation, strictly speaking, would no longer be a steady state as it's usually written, but it'd be time dependent. The number of civilizations would be increasing, maybe even non-linearly. And this is true even if the um, chances of getting through the bottleneck are very low. If there's some fraction that are getting through it, then the immortal civilizations, if you will, um, would be accumulated. 
there, there are a lot of interesting uh, uh, implications of this. One, that the human process is not closely linked to the likely abundance of a long-lived civilization. So we usually think, ah, oh, if L is high, then, then we're going to be fine, and there's lots of aliens. It may be that we're not going to be fine, but there's lots of aliens, because most civilizations don't make it, but there still could be a lot of civilizations. Or, as Franz Kafka said, hope. Yes, there is plenty of hope, but not for us. Um, <laughs> so is there intelligent life on Earth? Well, yeah, of course there is. There's cetaceans and, and corvids and others. But is there an intelligent technological civilization on Earth? Well, we're used to saying, yeah, we've got radio telescopes and we're radio astronomers, so of course we're intelligent. Uh, we joke about that, but it's pragmatic. It gives us something we can search for. Um, we can imagine intelligent life without radio technology, but could a planet have radio technology but no intelligent life? Yes, that in fact is a description, I would argue, of Earth right now. In the sense, <laughs> in the sense that you can talk about a continuity, continuity criteria, that technological intelligence, to really be technological intelligence, must be able to sustain itself for some time. Is this useful? Well, yeah, it's useful because, for one thing, if intelligent life is stupid enough to ensure its own destruction, then it should be called something else. But also, it is also pragmatic because, as you know, because you've done the math of SETI, detectability is correlated with longevity. So we can define the continuity criteria not by a specific time scale, although we can talk about that, but by a behavioral pattern. Now, I raise this in part because if you look at the language we often use to just when we talk do setting, we say, are there other advanced civilizations? Or might we have formed the first advanced civilization? In Drake equation, sometimes people talk about what is the longevity of our type of civilization. We sort of often assume that we are whatever we're looking for, we're it. But arguably, if you consider the continuity criterion, what we are is not what we seek. Now, just I know I'm running out of time, but I just wanted to mention, and this came up, the Bayerikon II meeting. And it's interesting, in the um, accounts of Bayerikon, which was what, 1974? 71, thank you. I'm glad we have an expert here. Freeman Dyson, both Freeman Dyson and Bill McNeil, in their accounts of Bayerikon, they wrote how, in passing, they wrote how wonderful it is that the Armenians have just built this huge dam, and they're converting this primitive, poor country into this rich, developed, wonderful country. And it's interesting to note, and Penny made the point yesterday that, that our thinking is rife with Cold War era thinking. I would say not just Cold War era, but during the first burst of the Great Acceleration, when progress was considered subduing nature in all these ways. And it's interesting, if you look at the 10 largest dams in the United States, more than half of them were constructed within six years of Bayerikon II. This was a period when we were subduing the earth, and it was wonderful, and we, we, man, not even humanity, but man, was conquering, <laughs> conquering the world. So this, I think, led to what I call the inevitable expansion fallacy. The Kardashev scale is based on this idea that, that it's an engineer's view of human history, because the most quantifiable and predictable quality is a steady use of energy. And so then we say progress equals unending growth in population and energy use. Or, given what we now know about our problems on Earth, Intelligent civilizations do not act intelligently. So there's another idea, which is sustainability solution to the Fermi paradox. I'm running out of time, but uh, Jacob Hasmix, uh, Seth Baum wrote a paper about this. But you get the idea that maybe that it's actually the, the quality of real intelligent civilizations, the ones that make it through the bottleneck, the ones that begin a sapiozoic on their planet to um, figure out not how to grow indefinitely, but to live sustainably on their planet. So um, I'm just going to end with this cartoon by John Lomber <laughs> called Intelligent Life in the Universe. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for an entertaining talk. And it reminds me a lot about uh, also work Adam Frank has done along similar lines about the sustainability. Um, I want to challenge, though, this conflation of the idea that we could have catastrophic you know, consequences to things like climate, climate change and our technology, with the idea that that would mean the permanent extinction of all technological life on Earth forever. Because those are not nearly the same thing. Right. It's very easy to imagine an unstable future where humans just yeah. keep being humans yeah. for another, you know, however long we're humans, with you know, these periodic flare-ups of 
global, you know, globally impactful technologies, followed by catastrophic, <laughs> you know, destruction. But life's really robust. Yeah, no, I mean, it's humans a, are really resourceful, and that could go on for a billion years. And it's not sustainable, and it's not stable, but it would still be a sapiozoic eon. Yeah, no, I, it, absolutely. I, um, it, it's um, it's certainly true. Climate change is not going to wipe out the human race. Even nuclear war is probably not going to wipe out the human race. Um, and there will be, um, you know, you can, you can look at a model where there will be prunings and then redevelopment, and that would be a kind of a sapiozoic. Um, contrary to that is the argument and the history that technology uh, keeps getting uh, at, at super exponentially, hyper exponentially more and more powerful. So one can imagine, and I could even describe here, but I don't want to bring anyone down, a technological development that would wipe out all life on Earth. Mm -hmm. And I bet you can imagine one too. So we could argue, given long enough, we still have to solve this problem of how to govern ourselves rationally, or we ultimately we could wipe out all life on Earth, and therefore maybe there'll be this period of the sapiens of like muddling through, but I, I, I don't believe uh, with the knowledge of how to like, wipe out life on Earth that it, that it won't happen without some kind of a radical uh, cultural transformation. And, th and that the, the planets w that live a long time will go through whatever equivalent to that cultural transformation is that will, and I know I'm getting into astrotheology here, but <laughs> that, that would allow themselves to, uh, to have whatever wisdom that is to not, not do that to themselves. But, it, but you, you raise a good point. I was describing things in a very simplistic um, this or that, and it could well be a much yes, more complex so the scenario. The implications for SETI might not be as straightforward. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, and if we had more time, the, 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 the better way to do it, instead of drawing this cartoon of like, well, it's either this or this, is to draw probability distributions and say, uh, you know, it, it's going to be more complex, but there's going to be some distribution of longevities that you could then map into a distribution of civilizations. Yeah. There's also another problem with that, in that a planet prior to intelligence has a certain amount of stored energy on the basis of all the dead bodies that have accumulated over time. On this planet, yes. humans have used up a lot of the available stored energy. And since we're in West Virginia, of course, we're in destroying our environment by digging up that stored energy. The next so-called intelligence that comes along will not have that stored energy available. And, and therefore, they'll, they'll have, have an advantage. Very different. They'll have an advantage over us. I've thought about this. I've heard that described as the disadvantage. They will not go through the fossil fuel phase. They would have to go right to wind and solar and what maybe nuclear. But they 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 might actually do things slower and more deliberately because they won't have those. E it may be a curse that we had that, not it, blessing. It, 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 <laughs> right, but the, the density of the stored energy provides resources to do so. Right. We so, are big because so you slow down, just like we heard about those organisms that, that live really, really slowly. Well, you're going to have a civilization that does things a little bit more deliberately. And, and, and if it's a race between, uh, between education and catastrophe, you could imagine if things developed a little more slowly, then maybe culturally we would develop a little, a little more wisdom before the power to do these things without wisdom. Anyways. <laughs> one short question and one short answer. Is, is, do you think it's possible to have a sustainable Earth, but yet maintain the exponential growth of humanity by going to other planets, Mars? And Not in the long run. And that was, that's what's interesting about, I mean, yes, of course, in some not ridiculous time scale. But, but uh, Hak Mizra and Baum made the point that if you postulate exponential growth, and it doesn't have to be a very, you know, 2%. Uh, eventually, you're growing so fast that you're using everything and you, 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 you hit the light cage limit where you literally can't expand faster than the speed of light and use up all the events. So there, there are limits to growth that are physically imposed if you go to long enough time scale. Thank you very much, David. Our final talk in this session is Jim Schwartz from Wichita State University discussing the concepts of intrinsic value for planetary protection ethics. We can get this one up. Maybe? You, you plug in. While he's setting up, the next session will be a panel discussion uh, that will run right up until lunch. Probably not you, it's probably our system.
There we are. Ah. All right, so uh, I guess this is the ethics training portion of the event, right? Uh, I did want to say uh, uh, I'm very grateful to be here. Um, this is one of the coolest events I've been a part of, uh, so thank you for having me. Uh, like everyone else, I want to start with the book plug. I've got a book coming out with Oxford early next year uh, where I'm sort of laying out a case for why science is really the most important thing uh, to think about as we're exploring space. And this talk is going to be based on a sort of small portion of uh, a chapter of that book about planetary protection. So uh, Cassie's going to tell us about planetary protection policies a little bit later today, so I'm not really going to say much about what they are, but they exist to make sure we don't get really super expensive billion, trillion dollar false positives as we're exploring Mars and elsewhere, uh, so that they're to sort of protect uh, the viability of the search for life. But you know, around the time of Alan Hills, um, people really started thinking about, is there an ethical reason to engage in these protection policies? as opposed to just a mere protection of science. And so, you know, suppose there's life on Mars, right? A lot of people were kind of persuaded by this idea that if there is life on Mars, even if it's only microbial life, the reason for protecting it ought to regard that life itself. So we ought to protect the life for its own sake as opposed to merely for the sake of preserving the viability of the search for that life. Uh, and another way of framing that is, you know, Ought we not regard that life as valuable in itself, as intrinsically valuable? Now, if we were to make that move, we'd be jumping ahead uh, of a lot of ethical theory in many ways. So this would be a big departure from how a lot of people and how a lot of philosophers would think about ethical value. Um, because a lot of people don't think, or rather a lot of people think that if it's not the human life form, then it's sort of not all that important, all things considered. So what we see in ethics is a sort of bias towards recognizing that only human persons are valuable in themselves. And uh, inspired by Catherine from the other day, let's stir up some trouble here. All right. So uh, there's an astrobiologist, Charles Topol, maybe you know him. Uh, and he's developed a lot of sort of views about microbial ethics. And he thinks we've got a way of overcoming that bias. And he'll say that you know, we can think of microbes as having intrinsic value. And that could be based on their possession of rudimentary interests. You know, we know what's good or bad for a microbe based on physiological attributes. They have latent tendencies and evolutionary capacities that might demand from us an appreciation of the value in them that transcends their use as resources. So he's drawing on this sort of move in environmental ethics to talk about, you know, when there are conditions that are good or bad for an organism, we can use that as this defeasible evidence that that organism is sort of good in itself or intrinsically valuable. Now, is that a wise way to populate the class of intrinsically valuable entities? We could have that discussion, but let's just grant that to him for the moment. Where does that get us? Well, he thinks we have this sort of constrained, defeasible duty to protect ecosystems and communities of microbial life. You know, so we've got some positive reason to worry about these things, to not treat them as mere resources, and that applies to sort of a greater extent in the space environment than it does here. Now, um, Kelly doesn't really like this view all that much, right? So, so Kelly's going to say that when we make this move to grant intrinsic value to microorganisms or even communities of them, we're sort of robbing intrinsic value of some of its force. Uh, because you know, microbes, if they are intrinsically valuable, don't seem as valuable as humans. So Kelly's going to say something like this, that the whole point of distinguishing intrinsic from instrumental value instrumental value just being valuable for some purpose, uh, in the first place was to prevent any kind of haggling over who was more important than whom in different circumstances. And in the eyes of a traditional defender of intrinsic moral value like Immanuel Kant, to even enter into a discussion about which intrinsically valuable entities are more valuable than others is to have missed the whole point of moral value in a fundamental way. So this is sort of this sort of theoretical ethical criticism of this move to try to grant intrinsic value to things that are not, say, uh, rational persons. Now let's look at Kant for just a second. I'm not a Kant scholar, so don't take me to be representing the state of the art of thinking about this guy. But he's got a pretty restricted uh, conception of what's valuable. It's something that only applies to sufficiently rational beings. Those are the only things that count as intrinsically valuable on Kant's picture, and these are the beings that are capable of delivering the moral law unto themselves. Uh, and so our obligations on this picture attach directly to those rational beings. 
So if I have an obligation to keep a promise, it's because you know, I would harm or do wrong to some person were I not to do that. Um, and so you know, on this picture, we've got duties directly to the things, regarding the things that are possessors of intrinsic value. Um, and I think here's what Kant gets right. Here's what I like about this view. It gets human-to-human -human interactions right. You know, when we're making decisions that affect human beings, we should not think that some of us are more valuable than others. We should all be on an equal footing. Uh, we shouldn't weigh human lives against one another. But when we try to say that other things might be valuable, I think this view founders. Because I think we do have good reasons to introduce other entities as things that might be valuable in themselves. You know, animals, other forms of life, maybe even microbes, things like artworks and nature. I think we all probably have intuitions about some of those things having a value that transcends their use for us or for something else. So I don't want to dismiss out of hand the idea that these things could be valuable in themselves. So we kind of got to give up Kant's picture at least somewhat. And there are other pictures out there that we can easily adopt. So another philosopher, G.E. Moore, has a perspective on intrinsic value that would be much more germane to talking about microbial life. So I'm not a Moore scholar either, so again, I'm not expressing the state of the art about what his view was. But you know, very roughly on this picture, when we say that something's intrinsically valuable, what we're saying is that it adds value to the universe simply by existing. That you know, its mere being here makes the world a better place. And there's a sort of isolation test you can use to try to determine if something's intrinsically valuable. So, okay, imagine a universe where there's a whole diversity of different kinds of planets and solar systems compared to another universe where everything is the same everywhere. What's the better universe? Seems like the one with more diversity is our answer there. So that's the sort of process by which we try to induce evidence uh, for why we would believe that some kind of thing would have intrinsic value. Uh, and I think our, the nature of moral obligation changes a bit on this picture. It's not that we have duties directly to the things that have the value, but that we have obligations to preserve or protect that value itself, right? So um, things that have intrinsic value ought to be protected or conserved, and, and what you're trying to do there is promote the value they bring into the world. It's not necessarily a duty to the thing itself, but to the good that it creates. And on this picture, it's perfectly coherent to talk about degrees of intrinsic value, about some things bringing more good into the world than others. So Kelly's wrong. Uh, we do have a principled way to say that microbes are less intrinsically valuable than humans without missing the whole point of moral value. Kant doesn't have complete ownership of this idea. We don't have to accept that picture. Big meta-ethical debate about what's the best picture there. I'm glossing that over, and Kelly can fight me on that one if he wants. Right. But anyway. But I think we've got to turn to this question, well, are we going to get anywhere in this sort of microbial ethics discussion? You know, are microbes always going to lose? And it doesn't seem like either of these pictures are going to be all of that friendly microbial life, because it seems like they're always going to lose in the, in the sort of uh, conflicts with humans. Um, I think the nature of ethical deliberation is different, though, in an important way. I think reasons matter, even if the conclusions differ. So Kant is going to tell us that microbes don't even have a chance. All right. Moore might tell us they've got a chance even if the odds are always really low. But I think that's an important difference because if the odds are really low, we still might end up in situations where that becomes a significant factor. And I'm concerned about framing in these discussions. So I don't think we should rush to really overstate the degree to which we're going to see genuine conflicts between human interests and microbial life in the space environment. Um, no one's forcing us to go live on Mars. There are all sorts of reasons to think it would be a tremendously bad idea, both technologically as well as socially and ethically. We can fight about that one. If you want to know what I think, again, buy that book sometime in January, read chapter six. Uh, but anyway, so I don't think the case for Mars settlement is all that strong, so it's not as though we have to be there for some super important reason. Um, so I don't think it's appropriate to take the default view that there's this huge opportunity cost to preserving that life. Maybe the reality is that those microbes can make better use of that planet than we can. So we can't just set in advance that microbes have a much, much weaker case to Mars than we would, or Mars or Enceladus or whatever environment we're talking about here. And I think, again, there are other framing issues because 
we should not think of this as a one human versus one microbe issue, because the human wins that one. I don't think any sane ethical theory would disagree with that. Right? So it's one v one, humans are going to win. And I don't think it's appropriate to frame this as a species versus species issue. If it's a human species versus an extraterrestrial microbial species, humans still win. And I don't think any sane ethical theory should disagree with that. But I don't think either of those describe the situations that we're truly likely to face. I think the situation is more like this. We're asking a some humans question, namely the ones that want but don't really need to go to Mars, you know, the Elon Musks of the world, versus microbial species. That's the kind of question that I think is most applicable to sort of current conversation about space settlement. And, you know, I'm not going to necessarily defend here a particular resolution there, but I think we are being negligent if we presume that there's an immediate and obvious answer to that question. That is a nuanced question that requires careful thought and deliberation. The answer is not already available to us prepackaged. Okay. We need to think about that one really deeply and really seriously and defend it with good reasons as opposed to gut reactions about, oh, humans are great, right? Um, so I'm advocating a picture here on which ethical deliberation is always going to be pretty complicated and it's always going to be really unevenly textured and idiosyncratic and there are always going to be new details we'll run into. Um, and when anyone sort of responds and says, well, you know, now your system is really hard to work with, my reaction and sort of mining one of my mentors from grad school, Larry Powers, to say, so what? Uh, philosophy's hard. All right? And I, I, from what I've heard about uh, Barry at this conference, I sort of think he might uh, have enjoyed hearing that reaction. Right? Um, and I take this to be a feature, not a bug. All right? So I think you know, we're going to be encountering environments where you know, we've got these ethical principles that have maybe done us all right for a long time, but when we go to a genuinely new place, we can't always assure, be assured that those principles are going to work and do the things we'd like to. It could be that the new experiences we have cause us to really rethink our ethical principles in important ways. So again, feature not a bug that things are going to be difficult here. And one of the things we've got to face up to, and this is the painful part of, of the lesson, is that we, we don't have a guarantee that the outcome of, of good ethical deliberation is going to end up telling us that the things we want to research are the right things to do. So the answer to some of these questions could be that we need to take a much more hands-off approach than we would like to as researchers. Not saying that's inevitable for every research project, but it's probably inevitable for some of them. So we can't presume that ethics is purely an enabler of everything that scientists want to do. That's a very, very bad picture of ethics. That's a very, very bad picture of science. But hey. None of this takes back the idea of the importance of scientific research, especially scientific research and space exploration. Hell, I wrote a whole book about that, okay? Uh, so I think science is tremendously important, but right, we have to keep in mind there are no such things as overriding values, right? All ethical discussions are push and pull. There are always reasons and counter reasons, and we can't presume that we already know the right answer before we even ask the question. Thank you. Hmm. We'll wait on Kelly here. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, thank, I really like this. Thank you very much. I would actually suggest that you expand, uh, if you go back to slides, I think it's two. Um, yes, this one. Mm -hmm. It's not just some humans. It's some humans plus all their associated microbes and other support systems. <laughs> and it's not just one microbial species, it's the entire microbial community slash ecosystem that they're going, potentially going to be encountering and potent, well, potentially going to be disrupting on Mars. So in, it's, it's an even bigger problem. It's yeah. not just humans. Yeah, you're exactly everything right about else. that. Exactly. And then it's not just a species on Mars, it's the whole ecosystem. So, yeah. And, and that's a very, I think even more so, not an obvious answer. Um, just a quick about how long do we have for this? You're six minutes. Six minutes. Okay, uh, Jake? Yeah, I really like the opening discussion because you frame an issue that we've all run into, which is being asked, uh, what good is astronomy? And it frame is saying that's trying to take something of an intrinsic value and turn it into something of an instrumental value. 
And just the idea that you don't have to answer that question, I think, is a very powerful one. <laughs> but I, think, I, I think you have to answer it. It's just both answers work. Yes, um, and there are and two I, kinds of values. You know, uh, and, and I think you know, uh, you know, when you, when you're a member of a discipline, you're very passionate about it, and it's hard to sort of see why anyone could disagree about it being just this inherently worthwhile activity, right? Um, but it doesn't take away from that when there's also another reason why it ought to be done, namely <coughs> there are sort of you know beneficial byproducts of conducting the work in the first place. So I mean, so part of the book, I mean, I've got a whole what twenty thousand word chapter about the intrinsic value of science. And then a whole separate chapter about instrumental value. So I think there are substantive things to say in defense of each of those claims. And we don't have to rest with our mere gut feelings about it. There are actually arguments to be made. Uh, Rocco. Uh, I want to bring home the point that uh, this drives further into what Katsi said. And that is that even if you don't value the microbial world at all, you have to realize there has to be a realization that this, our world, the biosphere, rests upon a foundation that is the microbial world. So just for an example, there are extraordinarily very few number of organisms that have the ability to biologically fix nitrogen. If we were to eliminate those organisms or that ability, the biosphere as we know it today would cease to exist. So they are, even if you don't value them, you have to value what they can do and what they do do. And it's, and, and the other thing is that our world has been a microbial world for most of its existence. And it could be that it will go back to being <laughs> predominant <laughs> after we're through. Yeah. And I think that's what we have to really keep in mind. Yeah, that reminds me of some things that, that Charles writes about this, because he talks about how, you know, one way we might sort of come to value microbes is by sort of becoming impressed of their accomplishments. You know, they've mastered the whole terrestrial uh, environments. And, you know, if we're thinking about Mars microbes, they can do things that nothing here can, but just survive on Mars. Like, wow, right? Um, so to, to presume that there's sort of no basis for, for, for finding a reason to, to value microbes either here or elsewhere, I think is very kind of short-sighted or just very unaware. Um, yeah, and then, then we'll get to Kelly after. So I wonder how this fits into the idea of a priori versus a posteriori knowledge, because discovery by itself is to gain knowledge a posteriori. And we will always be limited in our knowledge because science grows with us. So now we are aware of the microbes 10, 20 years ago, what, maybe longer, we were not. So um, how, it, this seems to me kind of like a logical, vicious circle. Oh, uh, so I, I tend to think that, that my perspective is very empiricist in that, you know, I, I'm very much willing to let uh, sort of new knowledge affect what we claim is important. And of course, that, that works both ways because your value judgments affect what you think is worth looking for, what you think is worth yeah. studying. So I, I tend to think I'm not really doing much of anything a priori here. I think this is, it, I wouldn't necessarily use that, that, that divide, but this is very a posteriori. Yeah. Uh, Kelly. Okay, so I actually agree with a lot of what you say here. I'm not going to take you to task on everywhere we disagree. Yeah, we're exaggerating our differences. <laughs> but for those, for those of you who haven't read the paper he was referring to, let me just say for the record, I like microbes. i got nothing against microbes. Microbes are great. Um, my, my point, I think one, where, one place that I think you sort of overplayed the point I was trying to make, my, my claim is not that it's incoherent to assign intrinsic value in degrees. My claim is that too many people argue that something has intrinsic value, and then they think, Done. And if intrinsic value comes in degrees and you establish that microbes have intrinsic value, you still have a long way to go to handle any kind of trade-off between, say, human interests and microbes. And too many people stop short without doing all that hard work. So I'll just shine a light on, on this part. Yeah, I think we agreed here and uh, had I 40 minutes. Uh, <laughs> giving you a little fair hearing. I've got one more question I'd like to hear from David yet. Uh, my question is sort of similar to Rocco's, but maybe something different. I understood the question you were addressing is, do, would microbial life on, say, Mars have intrinsic value beyond its value to humans? My question is, isn't there an antecedent question to that, which is, don't we have to answer that question here first? Yes. I mean, we've never, to my knowledge, I mean, I understand Rocco's point, 
Obviously, microbes have great value to humans, but I don't know that we've ever asked the question whether microbial value, uh, microbial, microbes have value on Earth beyond their value for humans. And if they did, it might require a dramatic reorganization. So, and so well, what I'm getting at is, uh, unless we think that through, how can we, how can we answer the question on Mars? Because we wouldn't, we would never be able to explain why we might reach a conclusion that Martian microbes have intrinsic value, whereas Earth microbes don't. Good, good, good. So, um, so, so I'm sort of defending uh, Charles uh, Cockle's position against Smith's criticism, and I don't know what view I really endorse there, but, but Charles talks about this, right? And he actually starts with a view about microbes generally, and it, it just so happens that then we get applications to planetary protection. So he's going to say that whole thing about, you know, things being good and bad for microbial life generating, microbial life being good, applies here. Now, what happens here is trickier because, you know, we can't live our lives without destroying billions upon billions upon trillions of, of microbes. So there's this sort of practical limitation that, that he'll say something like, you know, we have a duty to respect microbes uh, as long as it doesn't sort of require drastic alterations to, to living a life. So, um, yeah, you can, you can freely use your, your gut bacteria for your own ends. Um, but, you know, those sort of microbial populations that are kind of disconnected in some ways from an ordinary human existence, those are things that we have a much stronger obligation to, to conserve and protect. And then, of course, Martian microbes, it's, it's part of nobody, nobody's daily life to interact with those, right? So those have an even stronger claim to protection. And maybe that's an unsatisfactory response. So, I mean, maybe we think uh, Charles has got some work to do uh, figuring out uh, the value of microbes and what that means for us. But, but that, there are, I mean, him and a couple other people have tried to develop a sort of, you know, here and now uh, approach to that view. All right, thank you. While they're setting up for the panel, uh, let me just make a brief announcement. Uh, it is our belief that you all know how you are getting home from this meeting, <laughs> and that you are not at all uneasy about this. If I am not correct for any one of you, please let me know. Thank you.
Um, <laughs> that was it. <laughs> um, okay, Penny here. Um, so Jill Tarter was going to moderate this panel, but she's not here, so Penny and I are going to team do this. Um, I thought I would just briefly introduce the panel and me. For those of you who don't know me, I am the other Drake here. Um, I'm Nadia Drake. I am Frank's daughter. I currently am a contributing writer with National Geographic, so I am also a science journalist, which is kind of an endangered species right now. Um, I also write for the New York Times and Scientific American and other publications, which I think is why I'm on this panel to do a little bit of discussion about the forward-facing um, portion of astrobiology. So I'm happy to talk with anybody who has questions about how science journalism works, um, kind of what we do. And I'm also really hoping to get some input from all of you. Um, we also have Penelope Boston, who is at the NASA Astrobiology Institute. Um, Steve Dick, who is the former NASA chief historian, which is like a super cool job title. Um, and Jim Schwartz, who you heard about from Wichita State. So just really quickly, I put this ridiculous picture up here because I was looking for some examples of media coverage of astrobiology, which I'm broadly interpreting to mean any kind of search for life beyond Earth, whether that's microbial or biosignatures and exoplanet atmospheres or technosignatures. So I did a search for SETI um, images that came up, and this is like one of them. <laughs> it's actually really near the top of the Google results. <laughs> And I can tell you what story it came from if you're interested in knowing, but I kind of feel like this is one of the problems that we should talk about, uh, which is why I put it up there. But these are the questions that the panel has briefly brainstormed to talk about. And so I think if you want to, we can just do what people have been doing where panelists can pick a question to tackle. Yeah. Um, I'm really interested, actually, just to start off with a question that Jill had asked, which is, are we overhyping the search for life beyond Earth? And when I read this question, I was my first thought was, who is the we? Are we talking about scientists overhyping? Are we talking about media overhyping? Like, who is the we in this question? But I'm really curious about what you guys think of the answer. Yes, so. we are. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we are. We are overhyping it, and we're hyping it um, before we actually have the chops to do a lot of the exploration. This is a personal opinion. This is not NASA's opinion, I'm sure. Um, but, um, you know, we uh, find great PR value in concepts like astrobiology and SETI. And so uh, it makes missions and projects and activities more glamorous if we paste something like that on them, whether they deserve it or not. And uh, we're combating uh, the entire uh, human narrative literature and uh, movies that uh, imply that science can be done rapidly and that we all do this by one eureka moment under pressure after another. And frankly, Science is hard work and it's a slog, right? <laughs> in a in a room with people who do this for a living, like I do, I mean, uh, you work really hard, and most of it isn't very glamorous, and there's a lot of stupid paperwork, and it's wrong most of the time, and you fail over and over and over again, and um, it's not an easy way to make a living. And so, trying to reconcile that with the glamour factor that is pasted onto this. I think is very uh, difficult to reconcile, and it also gives the public unreasonable expectations about what we can produce in science. So, you know, if you don't find the answer to uh, uh, how to control Ebola in five minutes, everybody's like, well, what are you scientists doing? What are you medical professionals doing? And so the, the, the slow cadence of science, or the typically slow cadence of science is something that you don't convey very well. And I'm not sure that we can, because it's kind of boring. It's like asking um, you know, a data entry person to uh, somehow convey their job in a way that's exciting and uplifting. I mean, there's just a lot of it that isn't. And the punchlines that we have as the goals are very uplifting. But there are goals that many of us, uh, I would guess most of us, don't anticipate that we will really reach in our lifetime. Hmm. Or maybe our civilization's lifetime, right? I mean, some of the fundamental questions about something. So I'm, oops, sorry. 
I, I was just going to say, uh, I would argue the other side. Yeah. So, uh, so I've written the history of this debate going back to the ancient Greeks. It's one of the great questions in, in the history of science. And, you know, since Frank did the search down here in 1960, we've had the technological means to answer it from the point of view of, of intelligence. But I think it's also important on several levels, not just as one of the great questions of the history of science, but also for its value in what I just mentioned in my talk of this idea of consilience, because it's uh, so interdisciplinary that it's, it, I think, has the potential more than any other discipline to bring all these uh, various aspects together. We have natural scientists here and social scientists and humanities, and they, I argue that the humanities and social sciences are not just a peripheral thing, but all of these things are essential uh, and integral part of astrobiology. And also on another level, the, uh, the educational aspects. I think, in my experience, there's nothing that excites students more than, than this idea. I think uh, Jim might have some, some different opinions about that, about the, uh, this idea. But uh, I think uh, I would argue that it can't be overhyped, except, I mean, you have to try and stick with the, stick with the facts. And, uh, and uh, of course, it's the, you know, the movie industry and, and other people that do overhype it and give in the popular imagination probably a false sense of, of uh, what uh, the discovery is going to be like. But, um, That's what I don't like. Yeah. <laughs> right. not obviously arguing against the intrinsic value of Mr. Right. of all people. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying the way that it is presented to the public is yeah. um, uh, not helpful. Right. Well, to say that it's valuable doesn't imply that it's exciting, and to say that it's exciting doesn't imply that it's valuable, right? These are sort of separate ideas. Yes. Um, I guess what I worry about, because uh, I've tried to wade into what little social science stuff there is on this topic, is that if there are perceptions about how you advocate for disciplines, and there are sort of traditions about how we do this, and um, it, where does it come from? It's hard to say. I mean, is it this is what we think the funders want to hear about it, and, and so that's what's going to persuade those folks? Is it, are, are these things uh, what we think is going to get people interested in the topic? Um, and, and it's just when we talk about sort of educational inspiration, when we talk about public excitement, um, my concern is that, that we make a lot of presumptions, that we presume things in the absence of actually having uh, adequate empirical evidence that yes, people are excited in this kind of way, that there is some sort of impact on how many people enter different disciplines. Because when you look at the data that we've got, and there's not much about astrobiology or SETI, uh, there's a lot more about space exploration in general. You know, so it's a common argumentative strategy. People talk about, you know, when you look at NASA's budget during the Apollo era, there's a big spike, and then you see a few years later a big spike in degrees earned. Well, guess what? Every other discipline not just STEM disciplines, but every other discipline had that big spike. So you know, it can't be just this mere correlation. You've got to sort through the data in a more nuanced way. And when you do that, there just aren't clear connections anymore. You don't have a nice coherent story that says, you know, these big projects have this, this huge impact on education. Um, now, so, so maybe it's still the truth, but we don't have the right kind of evidence. So, but, but I worry there because, okay, well, even if that's not really happening, um, are, are the people in control of the money still going to want to hear those things? And if we stop saying those things, is that going to have a negative impact on, on how science actually gets funded? So, I mean, I'm a philosopher. I care about believing things for good reasons. But I'm also enough of a pragmatist to be aware that sometimes we need to, you know, talk about things uh, in ways that uh, certain people want to hear. Yeah, and I, and I will admit that I probably have a, a bias because when I go out, when I went out for NASA to talk about this, uh, people were all very excited, but of course that's a selection effect. They're, those are the people who are coming for <laughs> to hear about it. Exactly. So, um, well, I mean, yeah, I should say, that. from the perspective of someone who writes stories about a variety of topics for a variety of publications, um, we know how well each of those stories do in terms of page views and unique page views and engagement with the page and time spent on the story. Sometimes those metrics are really depressing because you spend a week putting together a story that the average length of time someone reads it is 22 seconds. That's fantastic. <laughs> it's so depressing. But I want to go become a plumber. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> not do that again. Well, don't you need page views with people with money? I'm sorry? Doesn't it, don't you need page views with people who have money? 
Do we equate the page views with people who? Have like in television, they don't want anybody watching the TV. They want to watch oh. the people with the money to buy those products that they're going to advertise. Uh, I would say it's a slightly different model. Yeah. Um, but the point I was trying to make is the stories that we do about anything in the realm of astrobiology go gangbusters. Yeah. Like people are really interested. And so where, like Steve, you might have a selection effect of people who show up, it's like we are actually just kind of giving content to a random selection of people who are, you know, for National Geographic, already kind of science interested anyway. But then they can choose the stories on the website that they want to read. And sometimes the choices they make are surprising. Like I'll be writing a story that I think is really kind of boring, but then it'll be the top story for, for a week. And so we just, we know based on the page views that people think astrobiology is really cool. Hot stuff. Really. And Catherine had a comment. So you've got some incredibly valuable data there um, in terms of time spent per story. So about how long would people spend on, I know it's difficult because it's different lengths, but are we talking like a minute for a story about extraterrestrial life versus 22 seconds, or what are we talking about? <laughs> um, it is hugely variable and depends on what kinds of um, assets we have on the page too. So if we have graphics, that tends to increase mm -hmm. the amount of time on the page if there's a video. Um, in general, I think, um, your average length news story that I would write is between like one and two minutes. Right. Which, you know, a lot of stories will do, based on the word count, they'll say this is a five minute read or a six minute read. Mm -hmm. um, but those are stories with several thousand words. And the stories that we generally do for the news site are seven or eight hundred words. Right. So if you just think about how long it takes you to read that. Yeah, um, so my follow up question then is um, I love your writing. <laughs> so so um, what I'm about to say. Um, should not be taken any other way, but so um, we've got words, we've got images, we've got videos. Um, I know you're probably not doing, you know, eyeball tracking to see exactly how much time people are spending on different segments of it, but um, you know, we probably have the horrifying situation uh, that you alluded to at the very beginning, where the images carry a lot more weight than your carefully chosen, beautifully honed prose. Um, so, what should we be doing about that? Um, when the images are actually distorting um, a variety of important public perceptions about different searches for extraterrestrial life? I mean, I think if we knew the answer, we'd be doing it. <laughs> <laughs> I know at National Geographic, the images are actually even more important than the words. So, like, the nature of that publication. It is, I mean, it's, it's different that way. That's not every yeah. publication. But, um, it's really tough to get a story even online there if the images are not strong. So we pay a lot of attention to not distorting the story based on the image. Um, that's obviously not true for a lot of publications, but I don't know. I mean, it's the same problem with clickbait and crappy headlines. Yeah, like, the headline for that story is terrible. Like, it's so bad. And the subhead, <laughs> it's just like all of it is terrible. Um, but, you know, the media ecosystem now is so diluted by social media, by, I'm going to say, non-professional publications mm -hmm. that you have to really work to get people's attention. There's so much information. Um, but one of the questions that has been occurring to me as we've been talking is, why do we care? Like, why do we care if the public thinks? Is there really a direct line between public perception of astrobiology and funding. Like, how directly can you connect those two things? Yeah, it's pretty direct. <laughs> yeah, can I kind of follow up on that? So, so uh, you can't presume that sort of gauging interest is engaging in certain other things. And this bears out in, in one of Steve's colleagues, Roger Lonius, has done a lot of work about sort of uh, perceptions of Apollo and support for the space program. And what you see is people are overwhelmingly approving of NASA and they're interested in space. But then when you ask them questions about wanting to increase funding on space exploration, uh, they're, they're much, much less sanguine about that. And of course, Chris uh, said something about this in his uh, keynote about how, you know, well, a lot of people have misperceptions about funding levels, and when you correct that, it seems like that they're more willing to support increases. And that's been shown for science funding generally. Um, but we shouldn't presume that just because people are interested in space that it's a priority interest or it's something they feel needs to be given increased fiduciary support. Um, I think we have to be careful when we say, why should we care? Do we, do, do we, do, do, do we assume there's a connection between um, increased public interest and increased support? Because um, we don't, I don't think we want to claim that's the only reason to care. 
about public interest, right? I mean, maybe there's an analogy with the previous discussion about intrinsic versus uh, pragmatic. Uh, yes, we want to, to we want funding for our research, but I think uh, hopefully we also have other reasons to want the public to be uh, educated and aware of what we do and we and interested uh, because it, hopefully we do it because we think it's worthwhile. And um, so yeah, I mean, we I think. If, if, if there wasn't somewhat of that connection, we probably wouldn't care as much, but hopefully we'd still care. <laughs> well, right. I mean, um, a lot of the science that we do and the missions that we send are publicly funded. And I felt that way even before my last three years as a civil servant, right? So even um, as a fundee in the, in the university world, um, we owe it to the taxpayer, but perhaps more importantly, from my point of view, it's we owe it to the rest of our civilization because we are privileged to work on things that are extraordinary in many cases and uh, we owe it to people to share that with them in a way that they can share it with us. Um, and I would like to see that a little bit less lowest common dom. I would like everybody to write like not even, <laughs> but I don't hold out much hope for that. <laughs> Yeah, but, but are, are we effective, and, they, and is page views or time on a page really the right metric for knowing what it is we're trying to accomplish? I, 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 I get that we have an obligation, and I get that we also want to try and enhance and do the things that we think and we know are important for civilization. But, but maybe we're not, maybe we're completely missing the mark. Um, and. And I guess I'd like to hear what you think is a better way of making sure that civilization understands what we're doing. Well, I think the key would be education on several levels, not just of the public, but of, of the media, uh, in terms of uh, um, some of the things that I talked about. Uh, uh, remember our history. I think I'm of the opinion that lessons can be learned from history, although it's been said that one of the main lessons of history is that we never learn the lessons of history. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, we need to know that history, especially in those, some of those analogs that I mentioned of what's happened before. Um, but especially, I think, and this is not emphasized enough, especially in helping the media and the public realize uh, the nature of discovery. Um, and, and that is that, it, again, it's not a eureka moment, it's an extended process, and this is, not just astrobiologists, is in anything, uh, but people don't realize that, and uh, it's going to be like uh, like the Mars rock was, or like Viking was. They thought they had the answer then, but maybe they they didn't have the right answer at the beginning. There are still people now with a perchlorate argument and all of this that think maybe life was found on Mars. Uh, so I think uh, you know this idea of, di of extended discovery that the media is not and the scientists are not going to be able to give answers right away. That's the way science works, uh, needs to be drilled into people and, and the media. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, I'd just like to point out that all of us were part of the populace before we became professionals. <laughs> and so we had somehow resonated with this topic to bring us where we are. So we all know a lot about this already. Uh, I'm actually the person that chose the topic here. Uh, astrobiology and the popular imagination because there was something that appealed to us. And I'm interested in how broad that is. And so I want to, you know, it, it is a topic that in some sense does not yet have content, right? The astro part makes it a topic. And so our imagination brings a lot to it. So I'm really interested in number five. And who proposed that and what do they have to say about that? Is that the uh, Western obsession? I, I proposed that, yes. <laughs> because uh, because as an historian of science, having written the history of this subject, it really pops out to me that, uh, you know, there's this long, very substantial tradition in Western civilization of, about uh, whether or not there are extraterrestrials out there. And I've shown, you know, it's not just uh, some crazy idea, but it's tied to various scientific cosmologies going all the way back to the ancient Greeks, the Greek atomists, mm -hmm. Aristotle, Copernicus, Descartes, Newton. The, the ideas about extraterrestrials are all tied to those cosmologies. But that's all Western civilization and uh, other civilizations, Eastern civilizations. Uh, and I know that Ted mentioned, uh, gave a quote from the Buddhists and another one from the Islamic civilizations. But those are just individual quotes. I don't know of any substantial tradition historically 
in those other civilizations about life in other worlds. And the question that in, in, intrigues me is why should Western civilization be so almost obsessed with this and, and not, not others? Yeah. So I, I don't really know that the, whether or not it's, it's common in other sort of cultures either, but I just wanted to point out that we don't have that many non-Western people in the audience here, right? And sort of represent it. So maybe before we sort of talk too much about that, we should at least acknowledge that there aren't that many non Absolutely. It might be a dirt. Uh, well, I've looked. I've tried. When I was at the Library of Congress, I tried to get people from other. Yeah. other Hang on, son. There's a lady back there. Go ahead. Other uh, cultures to uh, participate, and they either said they weren't interested or didn't know anything about it. Now, maybe I contacted the wrong people, but uh, uh, yeah, I think it's an open question. I just don't know the answer. Maybe uh, we don't have pantheism, and so uh, we're short on interesting uh, gods and goddesses. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm just throwing that out. Yes, yes. Uh, you're a patient lady in the back. Yeah, I was just. Like, I understand the knee-jerk reaction of scientists to be like, oh, the media coverage of this project is not exactly precise or accurate, and I'm a scientist, I don't like that. But what is the difference between overhyping something and just good marketing? Because we're sort of living in this age of, you know, climate change denial and vaccines cause autism and all of this sort of thing, but can we use SETI and sort of astrobiology to bring the public back to a scientific, uh, like the trust of the scientific community. Does that make sense? Yeah, so uh, I think the answer is possibly, but you have to do it right. And part of doing it right involves not just thinking there's one message you need to send out that everyone's going to get gun ho about. Uh, because um, the research that's been done about you know scientific literacy, there are all sorts of you know, correlations between socioeconomic status and, and there's all sorts of demographics in play here. And, and different values people have cause them to react to authority figures in different areas in different ways. And so I think you need a lot of cultural sensitivity in terms of how you do the promotion. Otherwise, you're only going to hit one group of people that likes one kind of message. So, yeah. Yeah. To answer your question, yeah. I think China has extremely sophisticated schools of philosophy exactly at the same time as the Hellenic period in Greece uh, before the whole uh, tradition was taken over by Confucianism. Right. But I can confirm what you are saying that in spite of their interest in many areas of philosophical possibility and explorations, this external life or works was not a priority. I mean, so, it wasn't actually, as I can recall, discussed in any of those yeah, yeah. philosophical discussions. Yeah. So, so why is that? I mean, that's, yeah. that's a very interesting question. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, and this sort of ties in with some of the discussion, but also ties in with, I think, is point number seven. The presumption has been that astrobiology is equated with the search for life in the universe in this whole panel, and that's specifically not true. It was all started to framed around three, um, three sort of sound bites. Where do we come from? Where are we going? And are we alone? Yeah. And I am so sick and tired of journalists walking to my office and saying, how do you feel about being in a field with no data? It's like, <laughs> well, I have no data. What am I doing with the lab of sequence dimensions and all these notebooks? You know, that it, it is much more than, than are we alone? Because even if it were are we alone, you couldn't understand that without understanding the evolution of our universe. How do you get you know, organics and have a planet and, you know, all of, and we need to learn about the future because that's the only thing that really is of vital interest to us till the aliens show up. I mean, the astrobiology is so much broader right. than just looking for life elsewhere, and that's got to be clear. Otherwise, astrobiology is ridiculed, and I have many colleagues in places like Britain who really are astrobiologists but won't touch the word because of that misconception. It's a bad name. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, I, have a, I have a comment in response to your uh, very interesting question about uh, the, the what's wrong, what's the difference between overhyping and just effective marketing, and, and can astrobiology potentially be used to, to increase uh, trust in, in science? The problem with a certain kind of overhyping is that when we misrepresent what it is we're really doing. There's a dishonesty and people can start to pick up on it. And 
one thing we joke about is like how NASA is always um, announcing, uh, you know, every week they announce they discovered water on Mars. <laughs> a similar thing when Galileo was in orbit around Jupiter, every single article that came out about Europa was not, oh, this is interesting about Europa, this is, it was NASA discovers potential for life on Europa. That was the way everything was fun. And at one point, my old 11th grade English teacher, who I was still in touch with, sent me an article about Europa. You know, NASA discovered cracks in the ice. This means there's life. And she, and she said that the headline of, of her email to me was, why do you people keep putting out the same story? And she was pissed. And this is an educated person. So there's a danger in, in hyping it the wrong way that people start to realize that we're not really, we're selling something rather than just telling what we're doing. So Nadia had a comment, and then we'll go to Ken. Well, I think maybe we have to go to Ken. We have five minutes left. Ken's so. um, Okay. Well, well let me just say one thing quickly. Um, yeah, go ahead. So there's a lot of pressure now among news outlets to be covering whatever happens to be like the study of the week or the big announcement, yeah, yeah. even if it's not really the way that we would want to be doing the story. We just kind of have to do it because everybody else is. This is really bad. Um, so part of what we're doing at National Geographic is to not do that. Um, but in response to your question, a lot of times when I'm writing stories, I like to walk readers through the thinking process and in some way try to illuminate what the scientific method is. And so I think if we can work harder to work critical thinking skills into stories, which everybody should have and people are not using right now in society, I think as much as they should, to develop that kind of critical thinking capacity is a way of building trust because then you can actually figure out why somebody reached the conclusion that they did and evaluate data on your own. Um, but I think also right now, the levels of trust in both scientists and in journalists are just plummeting. So I'm not actually sure what to do about that. <laughs> Um, let's see, Ken. Yeah, uh, I think that the reason that these articles promote uh, the NASA activity as opposed to what was discovered is because they're based on press releases released by NASA. And, <laughs> now, NASA is particularly good at it, but they're not unique. And I think this is what Nadia was alluding to earlier about the demise of, of science writers. Almost everything in the media now that you read is based on a press release. Whereas it used to be that you had independent reporters go to meetings, talk to people, and write their story, not the story promoted by some observatory or telescope or uh, particularly NASA. Rebecca, you had a comment? Yeah, uh, I want to address Steve's point. Uh, I think that Penelope was absolutely right um, in that we should start looking at pantheist traditions because I think um, in particular um, Hindu and maybe Norse um, cosmologies there are certainly the ideas of multiverses and um, other worlds. Um, but I think that in a, thinking about those things, we really need to reconsider the role that religion plays in public perception of all these things. Mm -hmm. I took a course um, at Oxford that was called The Psychology of Religion, and one of the themes we explored in that class was looking at how um, ecstatic re uh, religious experience, so like seeing um, saints and visions like that, um, after the 50s in the United States and in parts of the Soviet Union, started um, translating into UFO experiences, and U UFO visions. Um, and so I think that um, we need to focus really strongly on the religious aspects here because that's something that's largely important to the public and I think informs a lot of the ways that people approach these subjects. Um, um, yes, Dave. So, I, you know, I've always been totally fascinated with the search for extraterrestrial intelligence or biological life. Uh, but I'm, I'm a total amateur. But I've always wondered, increasingly so at this conference, whether there would be far more public support for the search if we change the question. This just picks up on what Lynn and others have said, which is, to me, the question, when you ask the question that way, uh, when you're searching for intelligent life, for biological life. Number one, you're subject to the Number two, the longer we don't find it, the more people say, well, you're a failure, right? And the third is, by asking the question that way, we're shaping the answer. We're, we're, we're uh, shaping what we figure out. It seems to me the really fundamental question is, is did life emerge only on Earth, or did it emerge also elsewhere? Either answer to that question is dramatic for humanity, totally dramatic. Whether we are <coughs> or not alone is totally dramatic. 
question to ask and to answer. I agree with Ken that right now we can't prove the negative, but in 100 years or 200 years, maybe we will. And if you ask the question that way, then this search has inherent value, and you should have inherent value. Yeah. We want to tackle one more question before we totter off. Do we have time? We are out of time. We're out of time. Catherine had, Catherine, had a, Catherine had a question. She was jumping up and down. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. That, that's I thought you were in my peripheral. It's just going back to that part about alien scope being primarily a Western obsession. Um, there's there's so much to talk about and unpack here. Um, but I think, you know, so part of it is exactly how you define alien. Um, so you were alluding to this in a way. Um, but there are abundant traditions um, that have ideas of beings in the sky. Uh, but par partly it's it's down to kind of your conceptions of souls and relatedness, kinship, all of those different things. So you know, many, um, many um, cultural traditions worldwide have an idea of a spirit that does not reside simply in the one individual that has elements from elsewhere. And in fact, also, I mean, traditions um, within Native American beliefs, it's quite common for um, names to involve reference to the stars. And that's not a Western tradition. <laughs> that's a tradition on, on top of which we, we don't reside. Um, yeah, but it, it's it's still alive. And so I would I would have to say that you know maybe the very specific form um, is a Western obsession. But if we broaden our definitions and, and think about the term in, in different ways, and I could give a long kind of anthropology lecture on this. Um, but there there are some some books that talk about different kind of cultural astronomy traditions that and, and this notion of of beings up there. Um, it's, it's actually quite prevalent in, in the reading that I've been. But are those non-supernatural readers? Those are, are, are those mainly supernatural? Or? <laughs> well, uh, not to put too fine a point on it, but the conception within the Western imagination, um, both were sensitive scientists, um, but also the broader public, that there was something that was shaped very clearly into the supernatural as well. So Al Harrison's book, Starstruck, dealt with that beautifully. I wish he was here with us. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> it all gets real fuzzy. Well, I think we're out of time, so I think it's time for lunch. Thanks, everybody. It's almost time for lunch, so thank you for the panel again. And I would just like to introduce Rachel Leaf. I would like to uh, introduce Dr. Fleming Krim, who is the CEO of the NSF, who happens to be visiting today. And we uh, convinced him, twisted his arm, to come up and just say a couple words to you guys before you go to lunch. So let me say a couple of things that I understand. I understand that I'm what stands between you and lunch, okay? So, <laughs> so th this, will be, this will be really... Um, so uh, my name is Fleming Krim. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of the National Science Foundation. Uh, I'm a physical chemist. I have spent 40 years at the University of Wisconsin. I spent four years leading mathematical and physical sciences. Director at NSF, and I flunked retirement, and the director talked me into coming back as the chief operating officer. So um, uh, that's who I am. So why am I here? Well, I, I'm here in part because Harshall and Carol and some people asked me if I'd say a couple of things. But next year is the 70th anniversary of the founding of the National Science Foundation. It's the 75th anniversary of Science the Endless Frontier, Van der Bush, that really defined the way we do science uh, in the United States, the balance between fundamental and applied and industrial uh, research. Uh, so one of the things we're doing as part of this is launching a series of, and this is quite related to some of the communications comments people were making, a series of brought to you by NSF. We're, we're very jealous of how NASA does this, but uh, uh, we don't have astronauts, okay? Well, we have lots of astrophysicists, but not astronauts. But um, we, are, uh, we are doing a series of monthly emphases on brought to you by NSF. Last month was the first one. It was about ocean sciences. Uh, this month, we're beginning, we're beginning one on windows on the universe. Uh, and, and, and I'm here partly because we're trying to visit some of our facilities where we do these kind of things. But as some of you know, windows on the universe is a big idea that we have. We, one of our big ideas at NSF, and if 
that isn't familiar language to you, I can tell you what it means. But I won't do that now. Uh, and, uh, but Windows on the Universe for us is really multi-messenger astronomy, multi-messenger <coughs> astrophysics. Think of what has happened in the last three year, years or so. We have detected gravitational waves and combined that with electromagnetic detection. We have detected particles with ice cube and uh, combined that with electromagnetic uh, detection that showed that high energy cosmic rays were in fact coming from active galactic nuclei. And just very recently, uh, NSF funded researchers <coughs> Uh, image, uh, image the shadow of a black hole with the Event Horizon Telescope. All of those things involve coupling facilities around the country from across agencies across countries uh, to accomplish those goals. So I looked over the materials for the conference. I actually looked at your Saturday night uh, uh, event, which was quite, was quite interesting, but you know, the Green Bank Observatory is really an iconic place to be thinking about the search for extraterrestrial intelligence or astrobiology. I was interested in the earlier comment. To me, astrobiology is small molecules in space because I do uh, molecular spectroscopy and uh, uh, chemical dynamics. And I think some of the comments were saying it is really, you know, that's one piece of it. And look at the range of folks here. It goes from people who are thinking about small molecules in space to people who are thinking some of the ethical and fundamental questions uh, of, about us as human beings. And it, it, it's really a, fa really a fascinating group, and I, I hope you're all enjoying it. And I'm quite jealous that I just get to do a drive-by and don't get to actually, uh, actually be here for it. So uh, let's go have lunch. I think this conference sounds like just a wonderful time. I want to thank Karen and everybody at the Green Bank Observatory for the amazing work they do. And congratulations on this conference. This is the kind of thing that if you think about, uh, I love the title, Earth Shots and Moon Shots. Uh, I think that when you think about the trajectory of science in the near term, where we have to get the money to do science and put it in the right places, and in the long term, where we're thinking about very big cosmic questions in science, you're the kind of folks that talk about that and do it. So congratulations, and I'm looking forward to lunch. Thank <laughs> you.